program is underwritten by the Hospitals of Providence, and we also want to say a very special thank you to the Paul L. Foster School of Medicine for providing the students for us. What they do is they answer the phones and bring the questions our way. Tonight we have Jennifer Ma, and we also have Janice Maleko, and we practiced that name, so that was kind of nice. Hi, girls, how you doing? So they're the smiley faces and they're the ones that really help us out through the show. We also want to thank the El Paso County Medical Society for bringing this program to you each and every month, sometimes twice, sometimes three times a month. Been doing it for over 22 years. I'm Katherine Berg and you're watching the El Paso Physician. Thanks again for joining us. We're talking about muscle and joint aches, pains, what we can do to avoid them, what do we do once we have them, and how we can treat them in the future. Um, we have with us Dr. Luis Urea, who's been with us several times. Um, in fact, I was speaking to someone less than an hour ago at another event I was at. You fixed him. That's what he said. He fixed me. He replaced both of my knees at one time. And so that was over a decade ago. So thank you for being here. Thank we you. also have uh, Dr. Zachary Lovato, who is here with us this evening, spine surgeon. And we also have Dr. Gerald Farber with us this evening, um, orthopedic surgery. I don't know if that's general surgery, but that's how I've been given that. So, and an upper extremity. And a, an upper extremity. Yeah, that's, that's where everything hurts, right? Um, so on that note, I would like to, um, there's specialties here. So I know you do a lot of sports medicine, spine, upper extremities, but to the audience at home, if they're looking at directing a question to one of you, all three of you specialize in orthopedics, yes, but what is your specialty compared to the other doctors? And maybe tell them how long have you been in El Paso, because you are... Well, I'm a second You're second a junior, okay, all right. El Paso physician who... Uh, Came back home back in 96. Nice. And uh, what I do is I specialize in knees and shoulders. Uh, disorders from what we talked about here with sports to the common strain sprains. And uh, eventually, if things wear out, a total knee or a total shoulder. Mm -hmm. Eventually, if things wear out. If, and that's, if. that's, yeah, that's more and more common. Um, can't say it's more and more common. I think that the surgeries, and we're going to talk about that tonight, replacements have become more common because it is easier and there's just so much more that has been happening over the last several years to make it easier for Definitely. both the patient and the doctor. Um, Dr. Lovato, so I have you down as a spine surgery specialist. Correct. That always sounds so scary, um, but how do you describe what you do all day every day to our audience? Um, I manage multiple different type of issues that you can have related to the spine, whether that be a simple pulled back or pulled muscle in your back, um, all the way to herniated discs to complicated deformity um, or fractures, um, anything of that nature, and, and manage it on a, a scale of being conservative and doing uh, you know the easy stuff like mm -hmm. physical therapy, oral anti-inflammatories, things like that, or taking that all the way up to surgery. Okay, and I like that, that we really talk about the entire gamut. Um, and Dr. Farber, when you you said upper extremities, so you specialize in upper extremities. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna keep you the lower extremities guy, I guess, because you talked about knees a little bit, and your upper extremities. So that's elbows, shoulders, etc. Uh, everything except the shoulder. I'll leave. Okay. I'll let Dr. Urea do that. But okay. But everything below that, um, injuries, fractures, uh, tendonitis. Uh, lacerations, nerve injuries or nerve compressions. Um, uh, trigger fingers, carpal tunnel, mm. you know, all that stuff. The wear and tear stuff, a lot of wear and tear stuff. Arthritis, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to do is start the questions in more of an idea of sampling what we're going to be talking about tonight. So, when people come to you, and I'm going to look at you as just the orthopedist, no, no specialties mm -hmm. here, what are the most common complaints in the world of muscle and joint pain? as springtime comes around, then there's summer, and then yes, we go into sports injuries and all that good stuff, but just with, just with me, the 52-year-old girl, it's like, hey, we got an extra hour of sunlight, I'm gonna go out for a little jog, and you know, us people. So what, what are the complaints that you see? Uh, I feel them myself. So, ah, there uh, you go, see? So you know, uh, with the beautiful weather coming up and warmer weather, uh, we wanna be more active, and so sometimes we overdo things. Mm -hmm and the body creates inflammation uh, when it's hurt, and inflammation can cause the stiffness, soreness in your muscles or you're around your knees. 
Um, and little, little pain could be a little pain, could be a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending how much you do, uh, it could be just simple things, or if you overdo it, you certainly can injure the structures right. of the body that need you know, something more than just a little of rest. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk this evening too about I'm hurting and I don't know why. And I, I've got a question about that, so I'll cover that later. <laughs> um, and Dr. Lovato, I'm gonna ask you about backaches. Um, you're technically the spine surgery guy, but I'm also going to just make you the backache guy, which is going to be a lot of questions. So I'm sitting in a car for four hours and I've got a backache for four or five days after that. So I go for a walk for an hour and I've got a backache. I'm throwing that out and I know it's so general. And so how do I answer that? But maybe if you can throw some causes as to why the muscles and the joints get a little out of whack when simple everyday activities that we do start bothering them. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question, and uh, a lot of people I see every day don't have a specific injury or anything major that they did or they recall. <laughs> you don't have to have an injury from a fall. It can be a lot of things. You slept wrong, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, it is a very broad question because there's a lot of different things that can cause those symptoms that you're talking about. It could be simple flare-up of arthritic changes that you have in your spine. Mm -hmm. I would say probably uh, more commonly for the things that you just mentioned about, you know, sitting wrong or, you know, sitting for a while and getting a backache, a lot of times it has to do with the muscles and tendons and ligaments um, in the spine rather than a pure arthritic change. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that can cause, you know, backaches like you're talking. I would say most often it's soft tissue related, meaning the muscles, ligaments, tendons, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Could be a herniated disc, but most commonly it's more muscle related, which is good news because a lot of that can be helped with therapy. Okay. Therapy and, and getting and moving around. And we'll, again, there's a lot that we, we start off with and we're going to go back to later. Dr. Farber, so when we're talking about upper extremities, we were talking with Dr. Urea what the most common issues are, but when you were talking about carpal tunnel and you were talking <coughs> about really, truly everyday repetitive type issues, what to you is the most common complaint in your specialty? Well, there's a couple, and it kind of depends on the age group that you're seeing. Um, probably the most common thing that I see that crosses a lot of age groups is carpal tunnel syndrome, mm -hmm. and that can be related to repetitive activities, although not always. Um, other medical issues like diabetes can predispose people to those sorts of things, but that's probably one of the most common things that I see, along with trigger fingers, which is a tendonitis where your fingers catch and lock, um, and a lot of people you know, have never heard of that, and then I tell them, they go, oh yeah, I've got three or four friends that had that. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna ask you to expand. So I've heard trigger finger. I, I don't have it, but I, I have one friend that does. It just, what is happening physiologically when a finger locks up? I mean, what's, what's going on with the jo joint, with the tendon? What's happening inside when that's going on? Well, what happens is it's an inflammatory process and you get a nodule in the tendon and you can actually feel it and it's always right about here in your palm. Mm -hmm. And there's a tube system that your tendons travel in and those are called pulleys. And that nodule gets hung up on one of those pulleys and that clicking is actually that nodule popping back and forth through that pulley. And so you either treat it by trying to shrink down that nodule, which mm -hmm. you can do with a cortisone injection or in people that don't respond to that, then, then there's a surgery you can do for that. But about 70% of people will get better with the injection. And is the injection, does that last for a while or is it just something that in, uh, decreases the inflammation enough to where <coughs> things start working normally again? Well, I mean, that varies from individual to individual. That makes sense, yeah. um, usually I'll do an injection, I'll bring people back in a few weeks. If they're better, then we just let it go. If they're mm -hmm. still having a little residual triggering, we'll do another injection. If they don't get better, that lasts for a reasonable amount of time after, you know, two injections, then we start talking about surgery. Okay. And when you say injections, is this an injection that lasts for a couple of months, a couple of weeks? I know it's different with every person, but on an average individual, how long Massimenos is an injection good for until it's like, yeah, it's time for another one? Well, I don't like to repeat the injections too often. For the first couple, I'll do those like six weeks apart. Okay. Other areas, I'll spread that out three months apart. Mm -hmm. But for the trigger fingers, I'll do two six weeks apart. And then after that, if it's coming back more often than that, then, then we'll do It's kind of a reevaluation situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Urea, I'm, I'm going to ask you about me 
And when I say me, I think a lot of other 52-year-olds who uh, just have things happening. So I, I've got something going on with my knee. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what it is. I don't remember doing anything um, since before Christmas. It's just been bothering me. I work in the Mills Building, so my real job, for you, those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm Vice President of the Paso Community Foundation. So we office in the Mills Building, and uh, some of my colleagues are like, okay, let's go do stairs. And that's our way of just getting up and being active. Doing stairs now is killing me. Mm -hmm. So, me fine, but the rest of the world too. When a knee, because it's knees and hips often, is starting to mess with you, when do you know that, yeah, I, I should probably go see someone or I'm just gonna wait for this to go away? I mean, for me, it's been almost five months. Do I keep waiting for it to just kind of work itself out and go away or do I come see you? And I guess my question is, when do you know how to make that decision? All right. Well, without any obvious trauma or injury, if you start developing pain, it's, you know, what I like to think is if the stove's hot, you don't need to touch it again. Mm. So if you're doing something that irritates your knee or whatever joint you're talking about, stop that activity. I don't do stairs anymore. It's killing me. Everybody okay. else gets to go have fun. I'm you not. You still have pain getting that from a sitting position? Yes. Yeah, so, for example, and I don't know what the proper word is, but Indian style, crisscross applesauce. Mm -hmm. I know there's a right way of doing that type of sitting, but if I do yoga and everybody else is sitting with their legs perfectly, you know, their knees are bent, I've got one leg straight and the other one's bent. So, yeah, just yeah. that position of having my knee bent inward, not just up and back, but just kind of inward a little bit, it's, mm -hmm. it's an issue. And it's so, another, you know, with a couple of people in our yoga class, too. So, I'm like, I'm asking for them as well, just saying. Well, um, in general, mm -hmm. when to go see, you know, an orthopedic surgeon, uh, pain that has not resolved with rest or it's getting worse, particularly if you have swelling of the joint or you feel like it's locking or catching mechanical symptoms for the knee, that usually means something's going on in there. Mm -hmm. In your case, the way you're describing it is you've irritated the front of your knee, what we call the patellofemoral joint, mm -hmm. the kneecap is attached to the extensor mechanism or your quadriceps, your muscle of your thigh, and that's what lets your lower leg extend. And when you irritate the front of the knee, especially the patella, it's not necessarily that there's something, most of the time it's not that there's something wrong like torn cartilage that we have to take care of, but it is an, uh, the physiology, mm -hmm. there's an inflammation within that patella that causes pain. Mm -hmm. So with the right exercises, with therapy really, and the rest, and it's not stopping the exercise, doing the right exercises, right. that you can get better. If that fails to do so, then we can, you know, we use medicine sometimes, injections. The x-ray does help mm -hmm. That's to what see if you, have, you if, yeah, if you have arthritis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but this is a very good example of, you don't, you know, a lot of people nowadays think you need an MRI for everything to make a diagnosis. And to tell you the truth, for 80%, I would say, of things that we see, mm -hmm. we don't need any advanced imaging studies because your history <coughs> tells us usually what's going on, an exam helps us, and then an x-ray can help uh, make sure we rule out other things. Mm -hmm. And again, especially with non-traumatic pain right. that started. So right. those are the kind of the, the way to, to think of, and what you're describing is, uh, knee, patellar knee pain or, or weakness of the quadriceps okay. that causes it to, uh, to irritate the front of your knee. I think I need to come see you. It's been too long. It's on the inside of my knee. It's driving me nuts. But I knew the show was coming up, so I thought I'd either ask you before or after the show or during. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Lovato, and I'll ask you more later. Um, so going back to backs, to, and I'm just talking again, everyday people on the desk, on the chair, all day, every day. What are your suggestions of simple lifestyle moves that they can do throughout the day that kind of helps out with the achy back? And let's just say you were talking about soft tissues. So let's kind of use that as our base of where we're going. If it's something that's really spinal related, we can talk about that too. But just in general to kind of help people get up off their chairs, walk around, doing stairs, No, not for me. Now I do the park, but uh, in general, what would you suggest? Uh, you've kind of mentioned a lot of things. Um, so yeah, you don't want to stay sitting for too long. You don't want to stay standing for too long. You want to kind of keep moving and take some breaks here and there. Mm -hmm. um, things to work on are conscious things you can do or work on your posture. Um, try to keep your shoulders back, keep your you know back kind of flat. You don't want to be hunched over. Things like that can really help um, you know prevent 
um, you know, kind of longer term consequences. Mm -hmm. um, and just staying active is very important for maintaining all the muscles of your back. Um, also having a strong core, that's huge on, you know, preventing back pain or improving back pain. Mm -hmm. That's a major thing that we focus on in whenever I send people for physical therapy, is really focus on core strengthening because that will help you have a strong back as well. Um, other things are the obvious things like weight loss. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get really good relief with that. Now, obviously, that's not a, a day to day thing. That's a longer term goal. But um, I think I'd be leaving, uh, you know, leaving out a big option yeah. there if I didn't mention that. That's right. definitely a good goal. And that's option. a great goal. Yeah. Um, and when you're talking about core strengthening, can you give some quick examples that might be able to resonate with the audience of what you yeah, can do I to mean, core strengthen? Uh, a lot of things to do core would be like planks, mm -hmm. um, sit-ups, things like that. But based on uh, a patient's age or their current physical activity, I wouldn't necessarily tell them, oh, go do you know, 50 sit-ups. It's right. all based on their current activity and how they are. Um, you know, so everybody's a little bit different. And you know, the good thing is physical therapists are usually very good at honing in and, and really catering a program. Um, to individual patients because everybody's a little bit different. But yeah, right. things that uh, that would really help core like like planks and, and sit-ups and any type of, any sort of abdominal exercises is kind of what I mean as far as core goes. And maybe balancing. I know we were on a show a while back that we were talking about geriatric patients and that just learning how to balance or just balancing on one foot, even if you have to touch the wall, that's fine. But it will help you too in case you step off that curve and you remember that feeling, there's a little bit of muscle memory there too. So that might be, I don't know, I'm just asking that, but I feel like that's something I hear about a lot. That could also just be careful and don't fall. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Just be careful and don't yeah. fall. Move all the cords out of the yeah. way, turn on the lights. Um, Dr. Farber, I want to talk about, it's, it's rare that people talk about elbows, unless it's like tennis elbow. Um, and I feel like, and maybe it's just the people around me, again, my age group, people are having more and more issues with their elbows. I don't know if that's necessarily injury or if that's a repetitive type of a condition, so to speak. And let's talk about tennis players, because I don't know, tennis players, I know that's a rotator cuff thing, an elbow thing, but in general, what are the elbow issues that you see and what is the, the cause behind that? Well, again, it, it kind of varies. I mean, there's injuries like you talked about with tennis elbow which is an overuse type injury and tennis elbow really just means lateral epicondylitis and it's not always just tennis players it's people that overuse their wrist extensors so people that you know have a free weekend they say I'm gonna paint my house and so they spend you know three days eight hours a day painting their house repetitive up and down right they get finished and oh my elbow is killing me because they've overused those muscles mm -hmm. <clears throat> You can also get the same thing on the inside of your elbow, and that's typically with repetitive flexion uh, type motion with your uh, hand and wrist. And so a lot of the motion isn't really related to your elbow, it's related to what you're doing with your hand and your wrist. Um, and again, really you need to listen to your body and when you start doing something that's aggravating that, you need to back off a little bit. Right. Um, it's not always an arthritic problem or a a trauma problem, it's most times it's overuse, and that's probably the most common. Um, yeah, we've been given pain for a reason, so when it hurts, stop doing that. Um, although I remember years ago when you were on the show with Dr. Urea, <coughs> whether it was you or one of your colleagues said, motion is like lotion to the joints. Is that you? It is. I feel yes. like every time I see you, I got to bring that up, and I use that a lot when we go walking in the park or going up and down the stairs. Come on, guys. Motion is like lotion to the joint. So now it's kind of like our thing in the office when we go do that. Um, we have quite a few questions coming in from the audience, and this is that show. Everybody's got some kind of an issue with a joint or a muscle, and so that's why it's nice to kind of give a, a roundabout face of what everybody's doing. Question from the audience. We don't have a lot of information, so this is my disclaimer. This is all we have. So we answer to the best of our ability. Uh, remember at the beginning of the show when we had to stay quiet for a second? There was a disclaimer. So none of, nobody can get sued if we say the wrong thing, um, but let's do the best that we can. I have a fracture at L1 vertebrae and I have back spasms. I'm scheduled to have an injection, I think it's cortisol. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that works? Um, tell me what the injection does and is it painful? So again, this is a question from the audience. There's a lot of, can you tell me, can you tell me, who wants to take this? I'll probably okay. take this Okay, Dr. Lovato, excellent. So uh, the question, it's, a, it's, it's hard to say that's not typically, uh, uh, cortisone is what they would likely be speaking of, which is a potent steroid. Um, but 
that is not common to use for fractures. So there might be a little mm. bit of misinformation there okay. as far as what I can tell based on the information we have. Um, L1 vertebral compression, it's likely a compression fracture, which is usually related to osteoporosis, and we call it fragility fracture, just how patients can uh, fall and develop a hip fracture. Mm -hmm. um, people can develop fractures of their vertebral bodies um, as well. Instead of the vertebral body being like a nice block, it can almost look more like a piece of pie or pizza hmm. whenever it, compression goes through the vertebral body. And uh, they're actually very common. Um, and Could you have a fracture and not know? Yes, I've okay. actually, it's actually not, I've seen many patients that have never been diagnosed with a fracture, but based on an MRI, I can tell if the fracture is a new fracture or an old fracture. Gotcha. And I've seen people who have had fractures that were old, never knew about it, but then they get a new fracture and they're extremely painful and symptomatic. Huh. Okay. So there are a lot of in interventional injections that can be done in the back. Um, the most common ones, I would say, uh, which isn't my area of expertise, I send to interventional injection specialists to do these type of injections, mm -hmm. would be epidurals, mm -hmm. like everybody's heard of. But mm -hmm. they're not necessarily the epidurals that you get during pregnancy. They're usually epidurals based at a pinched nerve, okay. um, where I would uh, refer a patient to an interventional pain management specialist, and I would direct them at, hey, this nerve is inflamed. Put a uh, you know do a cortisone shot there, and right. um, it will typically help calm down their symptoms as far as leg pain and and can help back pain as well. So it is not common to do cortisone with um, fractures. Okay. Um, so it's hard to really elaborate more on that. The good news about these fractures is most commonly a lot of times they heal on their own with conservative measures. Mm -hmm. um, there is a good um, minimally invasive surgery out there called kyphoplasty, mm -hmm. um, which where we actually use a um, medical high grade strength balloon, for lack of a better term. We do small little incision and poke holes. We use pretty much a big needle to get into the vertebral body. We use the balloon to kind of put the fracture back in a line. Hmm. And then we do, we fill the cavity that we created with cement. So think of it kind of as a cast on the inside of the bone because we don't cast adults. You would need a body cast for a right. fracture at your L1 vertebra. Right. Adults, adults don't tolerate that. The only um, age group that tolerates that is toddlers or children. So um, it's a good option for that type. Um, but the good news, most of the time these heal on their own or, you know, we try, um, you know, pain medications, bracing right. um, is very good at effective at doing this. About the only time I recommend that type of surgery would be if a patient has failed those conservative measures for up to three months and they have still significant pain. Okay. Related, but maybe not related. Uh, bone spurs, if there is an injury to a bone, I don't understand bone spurs. I know I have two on five and six, C5 and six. And they said it was, somehow it was related to an injury that I don't remember having, car accident, et cetera, et cetera. When and why does your bone, your spine grow a, a bone spur? And maybe just talk a little bit about that because it's injury related. Does it always have to be injury related? Um, usually it's arthritic related. Um, okay. Yeah, so usually it's just a form of arthritis and kind of what we think about it is that the body is actually kind of widening the joint to almost take more pressure off of it. You have a, try to make it a wider surface area. The issue with bone spurs is you can have bone spurs a lot of different places. They may cause no problem. Mm -hmm. They're just really a sign of arthritis and can be an area of inflammation. But um, it's whenever those, as far as spine related goes, mm -hmm. Um, I'm speaking about is uh, if this is pressing on a nerve That's or really causing compression on mm -hmm. a spinal cord, that is where you can have issues into the extremities and also pain in that area. The spurs themselves can be painful, mm -hmm. but uh, most people have bone spurs because most people have some sort of arthritic changes. Okay. Nicely explained, so it's really an arthritis thing. Um, and I understand they're pretty easily removed if that is the case, if it's something that's pressing on a nerve or not. He smiles very, at me like, yeah. It depends on where the bone spur is. Makes sense, um, of course. Yeah, yes. it definitely depends on where the bone spur is. If it's not, um, you know, in the, if it's not compressing on any nerves, there's no point of removing it, you kind of let it be. Exactly. If it is okay. pressing on a nerve though, um, as easy as, as simple as spine surgery can be, yes, we can attempt to remove them thoroughly. But okay. um, 
it's still a spine surgery. Because the only X-ray just looks like it's hanging off there. You just knock that sucker off, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm I'm joking, but I know it's a bigger a bigger thing. Um, mm -hmm. I was reminded that I should definitely tell you all that we are streaming live on Facebook. So if you want to ask your questions via Facebook, you are very very welcome to do that. Sometimes people don't like using the good old fashioned phone. Um, they like texting the question in, so you can do it that way too. Um, I'm going to ask, before I go forward, I've got a lot of questions here from the audience. I'd like to first see, talk about our playground here. And what all do we have here? I know that you're a spine guy, but what is this, Dr. Ray, is this a knee? No. What is this flappy thing right here? Is that a well, shoulder? Well, this was is somebody that, a... that got hurt and ruptured their patellar tendon. But oh, okay. So if we're going to, you were talking about, it's going to be know, that the, camera in the corner right there. You were talking yeah. about the, the, your knee problem in the front. Right. So your quadriceps are four big muscles mm -hmm. that attach to this tendon, called the quadriceps tendon, and right underneath there is the patella, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which helps the moment arm of the quad to make it stronger, and then it attaches, the patellar tendon attaches to the lower leg. So when you look inside, you're looking at what the knee has to offer, the cartilage on both surfaces, which is the smooth surfaces that allow for movement. And then right in between the two bones is the meniscus. Mm -hmm. These are two C-shaped gaskets. And I don't know if you can see very, yeah, there we go. S two C-shaped uh, gaskets that serve as like the, their stabilizers, but more importantly, cushions to the knee. Right. So, and so we hear a lot about meniscus injuries, and, and Kusha, right. is it a worn out meniscus that I hear about a lot? Can well, you tear a meniscus? Yeah, you know, meniscus is incredible if you think about it. It, uh, it can last, you know, you got people 100 years who've never had a, a problem with their knee. My mm -hmm. grandmother, who weighed 105, huh. and she, she had uh, never had a problem with meniscus. But once you tear a meniscus, a meniscus can be a, uh, from uh, an injury, twisting injury. Right. Uh, you know, soccer, football, whatever it is. It could be you going after a ball, quick twisting or awkward uh, bending down to pick up something. Mm -hmm. Usually the younger you are, the meniscus is good. As we age, everything tends to deteriorate a little bit. And the meniscus in some people deteriorates, gets weaker. And so those stresses that you were able to take on at an earlier age will tear. Right. And then once you tear your meniscus, the problem with the meniscus is it doesn't have any blood supply. Or should I, let me repeat that. It has very poor blood supply. Some places don't have any. So once you tear it, it's just a mechanical, it's a flap. It's like having a little rock in your shoe. You certainly can live with it, mm -hmm. or you can take it out. You can just remove it. Remove it. Yeah. And as we're younger, we can repair it, and mm -hmm. that's certainly our goal whenever possible. But as we get older and the tissue deteriorates, then what we have to do is take out a small piece. Back in the 60s and even the 70s, uh, we in orthopedics did not recognize how important the meniscus was, and mm. they used to take them all out because if it hurt, they figured let's take Ooh, it out. The whole cushion, cushion whole, just yeah. out. And then that became you had people with a lot of arthritis. Yeah. With the advent of arthroscopy in the 70s and 80s, starting to use instruments the size of this pen, we make two small holes, and all we do is remove the small torn piece, and that usually takes care of it. Or if it, at all possible, we'll repair it. The difference between if you take it out, um, you know, your rehab should be two to four weeks, depending on what kind of shape you're in and what the cartilage looks like. Right. But if it's a meniscal repair, then you're talking about six weeks on crutches, and it's more like five, five to six months before you're allowed to do all activities because it does take a long time to heal, and that's the key. You've got to allow the body to take care of itself, heal, and then you'll have a normal meniscus thereafter. And for active people, that's hard to allow yourself to heal. Um, yeah. We've been around a lot of people like that. We do have a, uh, a Facebook Live question. A uh, question here from the audience from Facebook. Does long distance walking and strenuous gym time five days a week cause lower extremity swelling? So, very um, loaded question, not a lot of information. And Dr. Farber, I'm just going to give something to you for a while because you haven't talked. You okay if I give this one to you? I'll repeat sure. it again. Does long distance walking, it doesn't say running, walking, and strenuous gym time, we don't know what gen, uh, strenuous gym time means, but let's just say they're doing a lot of repetitive um, weights, cause lower extremity swelling. And maybe they're, are they talking about the hands? What would lower extremity swelling mean? Well, I would guess that 
ankle feet. Somebody is saying ankles, feet, and that sort of thing. And, you know, from my experience, normally people don't get swelling like that from activities. You might get some localized joint swelling if you irritate that, but a generalized lower extremity swelling, I would be concerned about something else. And that can be circulatory or that sort of thing. And depending on the age group of the person, if they're older, you might need to talk to your doctor about maybe a heart problem or something like mm -hmm. that. So when somebody comes in to see me and they've got leg swelling, I'm not thinking about an orthopedic problem. I'm right, thinking, thinking about, about maybe a something else. Circulatory problem. It's uh, kind of to uh, complement this question. There's another question here uh, from telephone. 65-year-old man walks a mile, you know, almost two miles a day each morning. And he says his ankles start to feel a little weird when he lays down. Uh, I don't know if we have an answer for that, but that's more of a, a, a question slash maybe tingling. I don't know if there's anything to be said about that, but since we were talking about ankles, I thought I'd throw that out. Dr. Farber, do you have anything you want to suggest on that one? Well, I mean, if your feet are feeling funny or your ankles yeah. are feeling funny, that there's a condition in the in the foot that's similar to carpal tunnel syndrome called tarsal tunnel syndrome, and you can have a nerve compression that can cause you know, funny feelings in your feet, you know, after doing lots of walking and, mm -hmm. you know, that may be an issue. If it happens after he lays down, he may be taking the pressure off his feet. That could be um, a Almost plantar a fasciitis type thing. Right. Or, oh my or, gosh, or that's a whole like other, that. that's a show in and of itself. Um, <laughs> question here from the audience, and Dr. Uray, I'll bring this to you. 74-year-old woman with shoulder pain for the first time but good for you because you're rowing. That's fantastic. So she says here, does age or overuse of a joint through exercise contribute to this and cause a flare-up? Yes, but maybe we can expand on that. She just started using a rowing machine. So good for you for doing that, number one. But we were talking about if it hurts. Yeah, no, well, uh, certainly that's a, that's a wonderful exercise as, as long as you're doing it correctly and not overdo it. That sounds like an overuse syndrome. Mm. Um, Going back to we're talking about how important core exercises, and that's a wonderful thing because core is really probably the most important thing as we get older because it helps us with balance mm -hmm. and prevention of falls. Uh, and it also uses a lot, when you do the big core muscles, it, it uses a lot more energy and your metabolism increases a lot more than just doing biceps, let's say. Right. So th those are all wonderful things. But based on this uh, history, it's probably did a little too much too soon. Mm -hmm that's a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so the prevention of most of the things we're talking today are a slow progression with activities as you increase it. Mm -hmm. It's probably a good idea to give yourself a day rest. If you, it's one thing to be sore after you work out. If you wake up the next morning and sore, that's fine. But if it hurts quite a bit, that's a very good sign that you've overdone it. Right. So slow that down, wait till it feels better, and then slowly progress. And usually it takes three to four weeks when you can really get to that level that you want to mm -hmm. for normal things. I'm not talking about trying to play at a very high level. Right. And and then the other things is, you know, use ice when ice is a wonderful way to Talk decrease about inflammation. Ice. We haven't talked about that at all. Okay. Uh, and it helps with pain mm -hmm. and it's everybody has it mm -hmm. and it, it, it just works so well. So after you work out, I mean look at all the pro athletes, right? Yeah. A pitcher, first thing they do it's a big, and we do that at UTEP. We take care, our group takes care of uh, the University of Texas El Paso, all the athle athletes. And one of the things Don Hearn and Tony Cordova, who are the head athletic trainers, it's ice for all the bumps and bruises because it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you can add, you know, Motrin or any of those non steroidal so long as you don't have any upset stomach ulcers. Right. If you have any kidney problems, never take that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then stretching. And again, it's a slow progression. So I think it's wonderful she's doing that. Needs to slow down a little bit. And while it's hurting right now, do something else and right. then get back to that area. And be patient. So a good three or four weeks seems like a long time, but as it, as it, it goes, yeah. you need to give it some time to heal. Um, Dr. Lovato, I've got one for you. It's sciatica nerve pain. So I just think of this as being spine related. I've got actually several here, so I'm gonna read both of them. Can you talk about sciatica or sciatic nerve pain? What causes it and how can it be treated? So that's one question. I wanna be respectful of both of these. Um, so we could probably answer both at the same time. Sciatic nerve pain for four months, physical therapy for two or three, physical therapy two or three times each week, not feeling any better. Is there anything else we can do? So we can actually, Maybe just in general, talk about sciatic 
nerve pain, what causes it, how do you make it go away? Sure. The only time I had it is when I was pregnant, and I, oh man, it hurt, and luckily it went away. But so it's a fairly common condition, the classic sciatica that people talk about. Um, a lot of people use it for any sort of nerve pain down the leg. The traditional sciatica is really meant to be a pinching of a specific nerve root, the S1 nerve root traditionally, which runs down from the buttock, usually just on one side, from mm -hmm. the buttock down to the back of the thigh, to the back of the calf, and to the bottom of the foot. That's the traditional sciatica. Wow. Okay. But a lot of people come in the office and say, I have sciatica, and they show me a completely different distribution. Um, but most of the time that means that they have a pinched nerve, usually coming from the lumbar spine, mm -hmm. and it's irritating a nerve, and nerve pain typically, as far as the lumbar spine goes, travels in a what we call a ribbon-like distribution or a, st a stripe-like distribution. Mm -hmm. It's not the whole leg burning, it's a very specific stripe-type pattern um, on one side of the leg, and it goes in different distributions depending on which nerve is being pinched. So a lot of times based on what what area the patient show me that they're having the sensation in and the painful sensation which usually accompanied by numbness tingling a burning sensation um, and occasionally weakness um, a lot of times I can understand or where uh, where the nerve is likely being pinched and mm -hmm. then an MRI usually reconfirms that um, uh, there's a broad spectrum of treatment for this. Um, usually it's composed of prescription strength oral anti-inflammatories, mm -hmm. uh, time uh, time can make these uh, better a lot of times as well. Uh, physical therapy is also very good. Um, and then if we get more aggressive with our, uh, our non-surgical treatment, we start looking into uh, epidural steroid injections can be very good for that. Only if all those other treatments have failed do we look into any sort of surgical intervention. Okay. Um, so there, we have quite a bit of treatments and most of this resolves on its own with conservative treatment, but occasionally they do need surgery to get improvement of their symptoms. Only if it's accompanied with weakness of the leg do we get kind of okay. more concerned. And that was kind of the question of the day that nobody really has an answer for. So the average person that might come see you with sciatic pain, a couple of weeks, couple of months, when is it to where you really think, I know you're trying all these other treatments, but is there a, a time frame where it's like, I've had this for six months or is that too long? That's um, a great question. So there's a lot of uh, research data on that. And typically, whenever we're talking about sciatica caused by a herniated disc, mm -hmm. um, research shows that uh, somebody could potentially get improvement of their symptoms for up to a year after this. Now, there's a lot of kind of other data that shows that kind of magic area is about six months. So a lot mm -hmm. of times with my patients, I usually tell them at the, about the six month mark, you want to start thinking, okay, do I want to ride this out for another six months? And right. then potentially whatever you're, whatever you're with right there, you would expect to continue to have unless you decide to try a new treatment, which could be as aggressive as epidurals or, or surgery. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of patients can get surprisingly better within the period of several, several months. But we are talking a time frame of several months and mm -hmm. a lot of times it's not a couple weeks. Yeah. So it's, some of it has to be patient. But things I would tell people, if they do have accompanied weakness, true weakness is in right. weakness in the muscle and you not, leg not weakness bit, because or? of just pain, mm -hmm. that would definitely be a reason to get checked out because that would be something that could become permanent. And um, one of the few reasons why we do operate on these very quickly is if it is associated with something called a foot drop or you have weakness picking up your foot or pushing your foot down because that weakness could become permanent and um, is one of the few indications for surgery early on in a condition mm -hmm. like that. That's beautifully explained because that, again you hear about it all the time. Um, Dr. Farber, I'm going to throw this one your way. It's a general one, but it's a great question. How can you tell the difference between arthritis, tendonitis, or nerve-related pain? And so, like with my knee, I have no idea what's going on in there. So when you're describing symptoms or describing different types of pain, how do patients describe pain to you and how would you diagnose, at least in the office with the history before you take the x-ray or MRI, or et cetera? How would you kind of differentiate those? Well, for me, you know, if somebody comes in with arthritic pain, typically that happens when you're loading a joint. And that usually happens with, well, for upper extremity, if you're grasping or pinching and you're loading the joint, and I typically see arthritis at the base of the thumb. So gripping, grasping, mm -hmm. putting pressure on that, that aggravates the symptoms. If it's a tendonitis, that usually is more with motion and not necessarily 
weight bearing or, or pressure on the joint. And that's usually in an area that may not be right around a joint. It may be uh, in the forearm or it may be up a little bit higher. It's usually painful when you're actually using it. Um, and then when you stop, it usually improves. Mm -hmm. Nerve pain is one of those things that's hard to describe until you felt it. Right. Um, and having had a, a neck surgery for a, a herniated disc, um, I've had that pain and it's difficult to describe. Um, it's electric almost, uh, I think. Electric I and also it was just this gnawing pain that just wasn't like, it wasn't like burning, it wasn't, you know, it was just this gnawing pain. It can be burning, oftentimes it is associated with numbness or other neurologic findings. Um, weakness, of course, is, is, a, is a big red flag when you have you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but nerve pain, um, again, that's, that's a bit more nonspecific than the tendonitis pain or the, or the joint pain. Gotcha. Uh, question here from the audience. We're already at uh, less than 20 minutes. We're almost at 15 minutes. So we're going to stop the show in a second just to give the two of you, Dr. Uray already knows this, but at about the 10 minute mark, we stop the show question wise. And we just want to make sure that anything that you wanted to get across this evening is something you guys can talk about. Because sometimes the show does get, when we have this many questions, it gets kind of crazy. 67-year-old uh, woman, pain in shoulder, upper back for over a year. What might it be? Very general. We don't know if she exercises. We don't know weight. We don't know. I mean, we just have age. Um, and I'm looking at you as the shoulder guy. So what could be maybe, not injuries, but what could be some shoulder issues that happen just as we age with normal activities? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think this is a great example of uh, how important a history is mm. to learn about the location of the pain, what aggravates it, uh, and then your exam. Uh. And based on most, it's amazing, uh, a, a certain age group, more than 50% of that shoulder pain, quote, shoulder pain that people come in, it's really coming through the neck. And then Dr. Lovato can explain more about that. But that's that posterior or the back of your shoulder pain that's on the inside of your shoulder blade, mm -hmm. that's almost always coming from the neck. But people don't realize that. And, uh, and those are things that are very important. And then we talk about what can prevent things. And you know we're all computers and everything else. Ergonomics right. or having like a computer in the right area so that you're not always looking down right. looking straight at it good posture is going to help all that otherwise you can stretch those nerves that are being irritated by a spur mm -hmm. or by tightness but the posterior medial shoulder blade pain or in the back of the shoulder instead of here in the front mm -hmm. usually means it's your shoulder right but when it comes down the back and then it starts coming down the uh, your arm right that's almost always that's your totally neck. me so yeah. you know what now you get to have the question <laughs> so Shoulder pain, fine, but I call it the, the meaty area where you're just grabbing that meaty part of your neck every day. Um, and it's all due to, I was, for three years, was checked for MS because I would get numbing in my arm. And it turned out to be these little issues with my neck. And so insurance reasons, everything else, now I can't be uh, insured for disability, I can't be insured for long term, all this good stuff. So talk about um, when you have neck issues, when you're having spine issues in the upper areas of your neck, what all could be affected? We were talking about upper extremities. Um, maybe just, I don't even know what I'm asking. I'm asking, I'm C5 and C6, a lot of issues going on there that, that deal with my entire left side. And I talk about shoulder pain, I talk about lower back pain, um, but it's really all related to my neck and the way I hold myself. And you said posture. I am totally, and I'm going to do this on the air, everybody at my office laughs, but I'm at my office like this and I've got one leg up and I'm you know, typing and I am the worst person when it comes to posture. Mm -hmm. And I realize it when I walk or I get up and I walk around, but talk a little bit about neck issues and how it relates to everything else in your body. 
That's a really big oh, question. It's a big question. I think question. I could sum it up. I'm kind of long-winded, but I think uh, well, I could sum okay, it up Well, it's okay, because then we're going to go – after that, you guys are going to have your, okay. your time to speak. So, so I would try to break that down in maybe four different areas, right? Okay. A very common cause of neck pain and kind of in the, the meaty area you're talking about, like your right. trapezius. That can be muscle-related, ligament, you know, there's a whole lot of muscles back in the back part of the neck area that can all be a source of pain, right? Mm -hmm. That has more to do with your posture and things like that. Mm -hmm. Another area to maybe approach is arthritic changes or degenerative changes of the neck. Um, Perfect timing to use the, yes, this camera over here in the okay. corner. Look, so you made him stand up and everything. I love it. With the up. neck, there's multiple areas that can be degenerative. Here you can see the discs in between these vertebral bodies. These can be an area of uh, disc degeneration. Those can be a source of pain themselves. As well in the back part of the neck, um, they have these what we call facet joints, which is where the back part of the spine is articulating and these are joints themselves. Mm -hmm. Not a joint like the knee joint or a large joint like that, but these are uh, articulating joints. Um, so those can be a source of pain and degeneration of multiple sources of arthritis. Mm -hmm. The next thing I would kind of how I would break this down is pinching of a nerve right. or pinching of the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Pinching of a nerve isn't quite as scary. It usually causes that stripe type distribution I talked about, mm -hmm. numbness, tingling that you kind of right. mentioned could be caused from that. Mm -hmm. can also cause some isolated weakness. Not a scary thing in and of itself other than the weakness would be a, a definite reason to get checked out. Mm -hmm. What is more concerning could be pinching of the spinal cord because pinching of the spinal cord can cause permanent damage and you could have very bad degenerative discs or very large bone spurs themselves that can pitch the spinal cord. That can affect a whole lot of other stuff because all of the nerve signals that go from the brain to get to the legs and the arms go mm -hmm. through the cervical neck spinal cord. So that could, Would so you know if it's pinching the spinal cord? I mean, would it be a complete different feeling than pinching not the Not necessarily. Okay. It can be a very vague feeling. Okay. Um, and, and it's something I commonly try to rule out in office, and there's physical exam tests that I can do. Um, but pinching of the spinal cord can cause a lot of symptoms throughout your whole body, including it can cause issues with your legs. Mm -hmm. It can cause weakness of your legs, numbness and tingling in your legs can cause, definitely cause loss of balance, which a right. lot of people have. Now, a lot of people get loss of balance with age in general, right. um, but that is, a, that is one thing that I always ask all my patients, even if I'm not even seeing them for their neck. I have a questionnaire I ask, do you have loss of balance? Another big one that I tell people about that is a red flag of compression on your uh, spinal cord would be loss of what we call fine motor skills to the mm. arms and hands. Okay. So what I like to ask people, difficulty buttoning, buttoning buttons, difficulty counting chains, difficulty writing with a pen and paper. Those all require fine, uh, fine movements of the hands. Mm -hmm. That could be another sign of compression on the spinal cord. The reason why compression on the spinal cord is more scary than pressure on the nerve is because it can become more permanent. Yeah. And the goal of that point of decompressing the spinal cord is not necessarily to make a person completely better. The goal is to prevent the, the injury from getting worse. Exactly. And I did. I gave you a loaded question. I'm sorry. That was very selfish oh, of me. No, that wasn't too long. Uh, no, it wasn't. I, I, I feel like, <laughs> again, this show is so popular because everyone has these issues. Um, on that note, Dr. Uray, I'm going to start with you because you're the veteran on the show. Yes. So this is that time when we're putting everything on hold. What is it that you were thinking about this week or today or even five minutes before the show started and you thought, I really want to make sure that I get this across to the audience? Mm -hmm. What would you like to say? Well, I think based on the topic we're talking about is the most important thing is what can each person do for themselves uh, to prevent these things? Mm -hmm. And we've kind of just as a synopsis is one is a slow progression in what you do. Uh, as we get older or we overuse our tendons, which are the things that attach from bone to your muscle, can get weaker. If you do things in a slow progressive curve, it can remodel, heal, and you're able to do those activities. So slow progression is very important. Core exercise is really so important, especially as we get older, because we start losing some of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that we don't think, it, as you know, I just had a birthday, and I want to make sure that you know I don't think that everything's going to go downhill. But with daily <laughs> exercise, God. with right. daily exercise. Yeah you can increase your flexibility, your strength, and your balance. Mm -hmm. So, but it has to be on a daily basis. It has to be slow, you sh and, and, it's, and it all depends. There's some people that can do a lot more than others. So mm -hmm. it's real important to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's real. And then the last thing is, 
um, for arthritis, or we talk about lower extremity particularly, hip, right. knees, ankles, and your feet. I always tell people, if, if you're a bank, if I was a bank and I told you for every dollar you gave me, would you think that getting $5 back is a good return? Heck yeah. Biomechanically, for your lower extremity, especially the knee, but also your hip, is that extra pound you carry is about five pounds extra force when you're getting up, going upstairs or walking for every step. So, and we know that excess weight causes increased arthritic mm -hmm. problems, and, and, and that's one of the incidents why we see how much, or how much arthritis we have in this nation. So, outside of eat well, everything else, there is a, there's a true biomechanical reason right. why losing weight little by little you know, one, every pound is five pounds less of force to your legs and it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. It's difficult, it's a lifestyle change when we have to lose weight, mm -hmm. especially when it's, you know, it's one pound at a time. You know, too many of us think, let's do 20, 30, 40, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. take one, every pound is five pounds less or it's a great return. Nice. So I think that's very important to what you can do for yourself and hopefully, you know, prevent from having us having to, uh, take care of something surgically. Nicely said. I like the biomechanicals. We talk a lot about it during cardiology shows and everything else, but really this is the mechanics of it all. Just try to shed a little bit of that weight. So, uh, Dr. Lovato, how about you? I know you guys are doing great, by the way. Um, have I had you on the show before? No. Okay. So both of you are doing great. Um, anything that you would like to say that we have not touched base on yet this evening or something that maybe we have but you wanted to expand on? Uh, yeah, I would like to mention one thing. I get a lot of questions every day in, in my office about um, very minimally invasive surgeries. Everybody's seen things like you get a Band-Aid and you're walking on the beach the same day, right? Right, 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 right. Um, I'm trying not to <laughs> expand more than that. Yeah. Um, but I would like to tell people, go back to the old adage that everybody's heard. If it sounds good, too good to be true, mm -hmm. it probably is. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason why, and there's a reason why not every spine surgeon is doing things like that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes minimally invasive is not always the best way, and it's right. not what's best for all the patients. Um, everybody's different, especially as far as spine surgery goes. Everybody has a different problem. There's a bone spur here where th someone else has a bone spur there. Um, so. There's not a one size fits all for everybody. And a lot of people try to compare things. Well, my neighbor had this surgery right. and she did great. Or, you know, pe people need different levels of surgery. Mm -hmm. And so I would just tell people, watch out. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Mm -hmm. um, so just use kind of reason and, um, you know, get different opinions. I always recommend a second opinion. It's always a good thing to have. Agreed. And I'm going to put all three of you on the spot because I didn't ask you this before the show, but do you have a website that you like with your specialty that you can direct people to? Because the problem is people just look anything up on the internet. Dr. Google scares. So I, I use WebMD. Um, when it's a cardiology type show, there's another website with oncology. I do cancer.org. Is there a website that you all can give out that yeah. people can look in but, a peer review type study? Yeah, our academy, the American as uh, so, um, American Orthopedic Society, AOS, mm -hmm. has a patient website, okay. uh, OrthoInfo, nice. O-R-T-H-O-F-I-N-F-O, okay, OrthoInfo, yeah. <laughs> Ortho I get it, I completely get it, uh, and it's dot dot org. org, yeah, and if, and if you don't remember that, just remember A-A-O-S, and then you can uh, get on that, and that's a wonderful, it comes from Academy, it's all peer reviewed, it's scientifically based, mm -hmm. and you can count on getting good information from that. And again, for our audience, you'll be able to see the show again on kcustv.org as well as the El Paso County Medical Society. Um, because if you forget these things or it goes by too fast, and it's like, man, what was that again? But again, orthoinfo, O R T H O info.org is the place to go uh, because you can't scare yourself. Uh, just looking at everything on the internet. So, Dr. Farber, how about you? Anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like to get across? Well, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Be smart about what you're doing. One thing that I would like to see people do is a lot of people like to wait until they're absolutely miserable before they come in and see the doctor. And sometimes, you know, at that point, it's going to take a lot more to get it better. So, I like to catch things a little bit earlier is then some of the easy things work better than if you wait till late so mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, don't, and don't I hate wait. to say it, and, and, and people say, and I'm going to be sexist, people say men are the worst. Yeah, you know, and I think maybe it's because I do this show. I do wait, and I'm thinking, oh, it'll go away, my knee. So I might come visit you, uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. When it really starts to bother you, and I think that was an answer one time. When do you know? You know when you're just sick and tired of the pain. That's when it's time. Um, and it could be for some people less than others. Uh, quite a few Facebook questions here. I only have time for one more. I've got two minutes here. Um, they were talking about a torn meniscus, so I'm going to throw this your way. After a year, uh, his knee still pops. I cannot walk until it pops into place. Why does it pop? I don't know how quickly you can answer that question. Very question for the audience. Okay. In general, popping by itself means nothing. Okay. If you have swelling or mechanical symptoms like he discussed, mm -hmm. uh, that means you have you need that taken care of, and, and that will be taken care of okay. uh, by taking out the small piece, or it could be a loose body. But popping by itself without pain, swelling, locking, no big deal. Okay. If you have any of the other ones, that's when you need to see us. Locking is no big deal even. Okay. Unless no, no, there's locking. No, no. Popping means nothing okay. without... Lock. Swelling, locking, okay. or catching, then that's when it means something. I got gotcha. you, so. because I am a knee popper. Dear God, it's yeah. like I'm making music as I drive up the stairs. Um, I've only got a minute, so is a hot water soak, because we were talking about ice, is a hot water soak with Epsom salt good for managing hip and neck pain, or just in general, Epsom salt? Is that a really a thing? Does that help? I know we've got 30 seconds. Yes or no? Who, anybody, who wants to take it? I don't know any data. Dr. Farber? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't have I any would, data on it, but I tell people if it makes them feel better, great, but it's probably not really doing anything. And don't argue with your grandmother. She says so. so. If she says so, that's right. You don't want right. to do that because then all of a sudden the dinner stop on Sunday. <laughs> all right. If you want to watch a show again or any of the shows that we've got on the air for all the different specialties, you can go to www.kcostv.org. You would go to watch, go to programs, and then you would find local programs. You can find this station here or that this program here also with the El Paso County Medical Society site. That is epcms.com, and you can do it there as well. I want to say thank you so much to the Hospitals of Providence for the show this evening and to the El Paso County Medical Society. I'm Katherine Berg, and you're watching The El Paso Physician. Good night.